Okay. Um, so again, the meeting is being recorded and we appreciate the staff uh, for supporting us on the backside. Uh, Suzanne Hentringer is here. Suzanne, say hello. She leads all of our communication efforts for GAP. And then Victor Gascon uh, is also here as our digital health and project management lead. So really appreciate the staff and all of their support in preparation for the Global Respiratory Summit today. Okay, so again, this is how we will use the balance of our time. The general session where we have a year in review, look back over the last year and everything that we have accomplished and, and uh, some of the work that we still have on tap for the remainder of 2021. And then we'll take a look ahead. We'll have our breakout sessions as I spoke about for one hour in length. We will be magically teleported to our breakout rooms. So you will uh, not have to do anything. The team will take care of transporting you. And um, again, the facilitators, I'm very grateful for Magdalia Dinis, who is going to um, lead the breakout session in rare disease, and Nicole Hess, who is going to lead the breakout session in COPD, and then Vanessa Boran, who is going to lead the breakout session in asthma. So really appreciate these ladies and their willingness to facilitate the, the conversation in that session. And then here again, you can see the different topics that we'll be covering in uh, the capacity building webinars over the six weeks that I spoke about. So as we get started, I like to always start with why. You know, there's a lot of emphasis and, and time and energy spent every day doing the work that you all do as patient advocates. And in the midst of that, sometimes uh, if you're like me, um, it you, you wonder, why do I do this? Why do I get up at you know, the, the early morning hours and work well into the evening? Um, and I think that this particular testimony helps us to understand the why of why we do this. And so I'm very excited to introduce you to a patient. Her name is Alina, and she has a powerful story that I think will inspire us all to continue the advocacy work that we're doing. Hey, hi, my name is Elina. I am 33 years old and I am originally from Finland, but for the past five years, I've been living in Ireland. Initially, I was diagnosed with severe stage three emphysema when I was only 26 years old. And before that, I had spontaneous pneumothorax when I was 16 or 17 years old. And that was my first touch of issues with my lungs, really. A um, couple of years later, I actually had similar kind of pain as I had had with the pneumothorax, but it didn't end up being pneumothorax, luckily. Next time I started facing issues uh, with lungs, I was 23, 24. Just generally really shortness of breath and I felt really tired and had cough and my mucus production was a little bit increased and I ended up going to the doctors and I eventually then got diagnosed with asthma when I was 23 or 24 roughly. Then a couple of years later when I turned 26 and only a couple of days later I started to get really bad cough and my mucus production increased very much. Um, I Remember, I got a lot of antibiotics just to think it like it was something like a bad flu or something like that. But eventually the, bad, the cough got even worse. And I remember being on a walk with my dog and all of a sudden I started to cough and I heard a really, really loud bang on the right side of my ribs and after that came like a really intense, sharp pain. And I had tears in my eyes and I knew something wasn't right. <laughs> and when I actually went to the hospital, they found out one of my ribs had broken. And it was horrible, but it was a blessing in disguise because from the x-rays, they could actually see that there was something going on with my lungs. They couldn't say what, so they referred me 
to like a long clinic in another hospital where they did a lot of um, different kind of tests and took like CD scan and everything. And some doctors were saying that it could be emphysema. Some were saying, no, it can't be, I'm too young. <laughs> and so they looked for specialists in Helsinki and asked their opinion. And they said that it is definitely severe emphysema that I might have had actually already when I was 19, because they looked at the x-rays they took when I was 19. And they could see that there were already like, like um, first signs of emphysema in those x-ray pictures. But I got diagnosed back then when I was only 26. And at the moment I'm 33 and I'm still here kicking. <laughs> I work full time and I exercise a lot. I do like cardiovascular exercises every day pretty much and also I do work out four times a week like lift weights and I use three different kind of inhalers on daily basis and I also use oxygen like a portable oxygen machine when I'm actually like exercising whether it's I'm going out for a walk or lifting weights and I'm really active on Instagram that's, I'm not sure if I'm actually like supposed to say that, but I'm quite quite ac active there. And um, initially, I started my Instagram account in 2016, a couple of months before I got diagnosed. And the moment I got diagnosed, I actually started to share my experiences with emphysema because I noticed that there wasn't a lot of people who were as young as I was sick with emphysema and I felt so alone. So I wanted to raise awareness that actually young people can get sick with emphysema and COPD as well, that it's not just old people. And that if somebody else who gets sick has the chance to actually reach out and wouldn't feel so alone because I felt so alone the moment I got diagnosed. So that's how I got really active on Instagram. And I really hope that in the future we can, or now and in the future, we can actually raise more awareness of COPD and not to replace the face of the COPD, but to have this young face um, existing there together with the older face of the COPD, that there are two different kind of people who can get it. It can be old people, it can be also young people. That's my story. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alina. That was uh, super powerful. And, again, and I would also like to thank Gab for inviting me to share my story. And I think it's great that we can connect and share more awareness together of COPD. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alina. And, and again, I hope that you understand why I felt Alina's story was one that we needed to highlight here as we, we begin the Global Respiratory Summit to really demonstrate why we exist, what our vision is, what our mission is. You know, as we started this journey back in 2009 for GAP and myself joining in 2016, um, the organization has continued to grow and have a, a stronger collective voice. And again, to create that world where there is no allergy, airways, or atopic diseases um, is a, still a, a worthy vision and mission that we all can get behind and hope to one day achieve. Um, to globally support and empower patients with allergies, airways, and atopic diseases by protecting their rights, insisting on the duties of government, healthcare professionals, and the general public. And so as we go throughout the session today, I want you to keep that mission in mind. Um, the values that we attest to, that we you know, can derive all of our work around resp respect, responsibility, and relationship really are the driving forces 
that we utilize in conducting our work every day. And the work that you're going to see is not the work of one person. It's not um, you know, just what I'm doing or what the staff is doing. This is the collective opportunity that we have as an advocacy community to come together and continue to raise that collective voice and to support and empower patients from every corner of the globe living with these conditions. So we all know the burden. I mean, we, you know, again, hear stories like Alina's on a daily basis in our work. There are currently over 1 billion people living with chronic respiratory diseases in our world. And that is asthma, COPD, TB, and others. We know that the prevalence is growing of chronic respiratory disease. And that currently COPD alone is the third leading cause of death globally. We also know that greater than 90% of the deaths from chronic respiratory disease occur in low to middle income countries. And that unfortunately, patient advocacy and patient empowerment are often under-recognized and underrepresented in those low to middle income countries. And so that is why you will continue to see a significant emphasis of the work of GAP in partnering with low to middle income countries to start new patient advocacy organizations and to advance the patient voice. There has been a slight decrease in the burden over the past 10 years. Uh, when we look at asthma specifically and, and asthma in childhood, uh, as well as in COPD, we've seen some increases in improvements in care in the overall hospitalization and burden. And it, especially even in the pandemic where there have been extensive measures around social distancing, hand washing, um, wearing a mask, all of that infection control has declined the number of exacerbations and flares that have been experienced um, in chronic respiratory disease. However, we also know that there's still far too many people that are ending up in the emergency department, in the hospital, and unfortunately continuing to die from chronic respiratory disease. So again, when we think about the um, you know, community that we serve, the population that we serve, the voice and the message that we carry to policymakers, we have to stand confidently in the fact that over 20% of most countries are living with a chronic respiratory disease like asthma or COPD. And more than 40% of those patients have three or more chronic diseases or comorbidities. And that is why we have chosen to continue to partner on the global scale with organizations like the World Health Organization. The WHO Global NCD Action Plan of 2020 has been a very guiding document in the work that we are conducting. And our role continues to be active with the WHO GARD, the Global Alliance for Respiratory Disease. And we're going to hear in just a moment from Sarah Rylance, who has joined WHO and is our liaison to the World Health Organization in addressing respiratory disease. We also are working alongside um, several key opinion leaders with, on the Global Asthma Network uh, report that will be coming out in 2022. I authored the patient advocacy chapter of that report in 2018 and am doing so again in 2022. And so again, this is a wonderful document. If you don't have the 2018 version, we would be happy to send it out to you um, electronically, uh, but we also have it in print. And it really does lay out the continued burden of asthma worldwide. And so we're looking forward to the updated report in 2022 and appreciate the opportunity to bring the patient advocate voice forward in that report. But we can't talk about the burden or what's happening in chronic respiratory disease without highlighting the COVID-19 pandemic. 
and the area that has captured so much of our time, attention, headlines, uh, policymakers, uh, you know, attention as well in the last two years. Uh, it seems like a very long time ago that in December of 2019, COVID-19 came onto the screen, onto the um, stage it, from Wuhan, China. Then in Italy, we began to see cases in February of 2020. In the US, that was March of 2020. The European countries, March of 2020. And before we knew it, we found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. We now are approaching the two-year mark, the 24 months of sustained focus on respiratory disease, and on COVID specifically. And we believe that GAP continues to play an important role in really collecti collecting and sharing the stories of patients that are living now with long haul COVID. And so this is an area, again, as we look forward, that I think you'll continue to see uh, more information and data because the likelihood is that these patients will be diagnosed as having asthma or COPD in many cases rather than fully recognizing long haul COVID and the implications of that disease. So this provides yet another opportunity for us as a community, for you as your individual organizations in your countries, um, but also on the global stage to bring that patient voice forward and continue to highlight the, the need and the emphasis on chronic respiratory disease. So I shared a bit about GAP and kind of where we are, where, how we've grown. And we now have, as I said, over 60 member organizations. We also have identified at least 20 additional um, organizations to engage and to bring into the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform uh, family. And so we'll continue to grow as long as there are regions of that map that are, are blue, we need to turn them green and ensure that we've got a strong patient advocate voice uh, for every country and region around the world. Um, I've talked a little bit about our partnership with the WHO, but I also wanna highlight that we are doing tremendous work with the World Allergy Organization, with the Forum for International Respiratory Societies, with Global Skin and the patient advocacy community in atopic dermatitis and urticaria, as well as GINA and GOLD, um, the Global Guidelines Committees for Asthma and COPD. And we, I act as a patient reviewer, as I know several of you do, on those Global Guideline Committees. Um, we are convening all of these organizations in the first annual Respiratory Right Care Summit on October 15th. And we're very excited about this as an opportunity to bring the global leaders of the respiratory community together to discuss the policy changes that are needed in four critical areas. And so again, we uh, will be hosting that meeting and reporting that back to you all in the coming weeks. But our 2021 projects are listed here. And you can see that GAP is as strong as ever. Even in the midst of the pandemic, um, our work continues. And so the, the projects like our Type 2 Patient Navigator, which is launching very soon, it is a virtual Congress um, where we are highlighting eosinophilic-driven diseases and Type 2 inflammatory diseases like uh, EOE, EGPA, nasal polyposis, atopic dermatitis, eosinophilic asthma, all of these conditions we know have that common thread of type two inflammation. And this will be a 100 day virtual online Congress where we will provide links to uh, in-country resources, but also education materials and resources uh, for patients to learn more about diagnosis, treatment, and management of type two conditions. We also have several registry projects that are hosted by different member organizations. There is an atopic dermatitis registry called Secure Derm, um, a COVID-19 registry, 
the Asthma 360 program hosted by Allergy and Asthma Network, and then the COPD 360 registry hosted by COPD Foundation. And these are opportunities, again, for our community to collect valuable data and to follow and, and, and to um, monitor patients, patient journey over time. And then through that data, we're able to better understand what are the unmet needs, what are the burdens, and how can we continue to innovate and research to address those burdens. So I would certainly encourage you to participate in the registries, to encourage your uh, communities to participate in the registries, and also to contact the organizations that are hosting the registries around potential opportunities for data share agreements so that we can work together to continue to uh, better understand the patient journey and to advance uh, care for the millions of patients that we serve. We are working with the Precision Severe Asthma Program. Um, that is a multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary stakeholder group um, hosted by AstraZeneca. There are several campaigns under that Precision Severe Asthma Program, including a campaign called Breakover Alliance, um, which several of our organizations have been very actively participating in. Uh, Vanessa Boran actually spoke at the ERS and shared their experience at Asthma Canada with the Breakover Reliance campaign, which is aimed at reducing the overuse of short-acting bronchodilators. Uh, so a very successful campaign there in Canada that has garnered a lot of attention and began to initiate a productive discussion around policy change to uh, reduce the use of, uh, or the inappropriate use of SABA. There also is a new or a council that has been announced uh, that GAP and ERS are co-hosting. It is an international respiratory council that is going to be meeting on a routine basis, really, again, focused on the advancement and prioritization of respiratory in global policy discussions. And so this was announced at ERS. And we are excited to uh, be one of the two lead organizations on the International Respiratory Council. Our team has worked diligently to continue to update our website and to optimize our website. And so if you've not visited the gap.org website in some time, I would highly encourage you to do so. There is a wealth of information um, and, and certainly what we would encourage you to do as well is to provide us with links to your resources that we can embed in to that content. We are wanting to continue to develop a central library or repository of all the resources across the world in these particular topics. Our World Awareness Days continue. Every year we have the heightened awareness uh, of asthma, atopic dermatitis, COPD, World Lung Day, and World Urticaria Day. And several of these are forthcoming here in the month of September and October uh, with World Lung Day coming up on September 25th and then World Urticaria Day on October 1st. And then we have a new campaign called Act on COPD that will be coming up for World COPD Awareness Day as well. In the last year, we've had over 10 peer reviewed publications um, and again, these cover a variety of topics, but it has been my honor and pleasure to really be involved in a number of different writing projects to advance quality standards, to advance patient rights and responsibilities of government, to um, certainly help bring that patient voice forward in the medical literature when it comes to asthma and COPD. Many of you participated in our scientific meeting um, back in June and, <clears throat> I'm sorry, July, I forgot, this year was in July, at the beginning of July. Um, we had a very successful scientific meeting and we are also partnering on a LATAM summit in December of this year to help continue to build out the uh, network of patient advocates in that region of the world. Our Define Your Asthma campaign has continued with new content, with new resources, 
I spoke earlier about the Respiratory Right Care Summit uh, on the global level. What we plan to have after that meeting on October 15th is an advocacy toolkit with approximately 20 different policy positions and statements that you can use and take and adapt and translate into your country. We would uh, provide a toolkit that you could actually host a respiratory right care summit in your host country and assemble the thought leaders to continue to advance the policy initiatives. And as we go into our breakout sessions today, you'll have an opportunity by disease area to really highlight what policy changes are most needed. We are hosting um, the eosinophilic esophagitis exchange, which is an event of assembling patient advocates in EOE um, here in the next couple of weeks. And these are some of the new organizations that have come online at GAP uh, in these areas of other type two inflammatory and atopic conditions. And then finally, on October 1st, we'll be launching a uh, chronic urticaria shared decision-making tool. This is a tool that will be released initially in English and is a self-guided tool that patients can um, answer some questions and in about 10 minutes, identify their preferences and values and then share that information with their doctor to have a more productive discussion around treatment options in chronic urticaria. So a lot going on here at GAP in the last year. And again, most of it is focused in that respiratory area, but you'll also see other areas like um, eosinophilic esophagitis, urticaria, and atopic dermatitis, which are all areas that GAP continues to support patient organizations uh, aligned with our mission. I want to spend a moment sharing with you a new resource that has just uh, been released in the last few weeks, and it is Patient Empowerment Guides in COPD. This is a collective pro collaborative project um, that was done with uh, the organizations listed here from Spain, and Nicole uh, Hess actually led that effort alongside Victor Gascon uh, from GAP. And these are patient-friendly approaches to the international standard guides. Uh, again, we use this patient value proposition methodology and presented these guides at the ELF Patient Day, uh, but also have shared them with the COPD Steering Committee and will present them in October at the Simmergen Primary Care Summit. Uh, these guides are now available in English, Spanish, Russian, Ukrainian, German, and French. And so you can visit the website gap.org forward slash COPD forward slash patient empowerment guides to see all of the wonderful work that uh, was achieved in this particular project. Uh, Nicole, would you like to say anything about the project? I think that was a great teamwork project, and I'm very happy that we achieved this, also with the help of Gundola. Gundola will be here today as well, I have to say this. And thanks as well to Victor, he did a great job, so really, <laughs> it's great. And I invite you to visit it and to see it. And what Tonya said before, you can achieve this project in different languages, but if you need another language, no problem at all. You only have to contact the GAP and they will translate it for you. I think this is quite important to say as well. So great project. And I hope that will help a lot of patients of COPD and caregivers to have a better understanding of their illness, of the disease. Agree. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you for reminding us uh, again, if you have the desire to translate this into any other language, please let us know. We will be happy to support that effort. Another project that we are excited to share is uh, two miniature videos, mini videos around shared decision making and clinical trials. Um, these are two very uh, short but powerful video vignettes uh, that are about two minutes long that explain what shared decision making is and why it's important in respiratory care as well as clinical trial participation. And these will be provided in English, 
but there will also be Spanish and Italian subtitles. So if you wish, again, after viewing these to have them translated with other subtitles, we would be open and willing to do that as well. So I mentioned earlier about our partnership with the World Health Organization and our participation in WHO's GARD. Um, I asked Sarah Rylance, who is the new medical officer in the NCD management unit at WHO, to share with us a brief thought around the importance of GAP participating with the World Health Organization and working together to promote health and keep the world safe while serving the vulnerable. So let's hear from Sarah now. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you are in the world. My name is Sarah Rylance. I'm the Medical Officer for Chronic Respiratory Diseases in the NCD Department at WHO Headquarters. I started this role in January, and during my first year in post, I'm working to build links with organisations who have an interest in improving care for people with asthma and COPD across the globe such as the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform. Tonya invited me to give a brief presentation today. Unfortunately, I can't join the meeting, but I thought it might be helpful to give a quick background to the priority areas relating to chronic respiratory diseases at WHO headquarters. We can start from a broad non-communicable diseases perspective and then focus more specifically on asthma and COPD. WHO's mission is to promote health, keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. The WHO work plan for the five year period 2019 to 2023 is set out in the 13th General Programme of Work. This work plan was approved by the World Health Assembly in 2018 and includes three interconnected strategic priorities. Achieving universal health coverage, addressing health emergencies and promoting healthier populations. Activities to address this triple billion goal will be delivered across the three levels of the organisation at headquarters, regional offices and country offices. The work of the non-communicable diseases or NCD department at headquarters largely falls under the universal health coverage target. Much of our work is directed to enable countries to provide high quality people-centred health services based on primary healthcare strategies and comprehensive essential services packages. The work of WHO staff is driven by the member states through the World Health Assembly and United Nations General Assembly. So what is the mandate for our work relating to chronic respiratory diseases? Well, while there are no resolutions or declarations relating specifically to chronic respiratory diseases, there has been considerable activity relating to the overarching umbrella of NCDs. In the past decade, there have been three United Nations General Assembly high-level meetings on NCDs. The outcome of the first in 2011 was the United Nations Political Declaration on NCDs and following on from this, the WHO Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of NCDs was endorsed by the World Health Assembly in 2013. The Global Action Plan contains nine voluntary targets, including a 25% relative reduction in premature mortality from cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes or chronic respiratory diseases, including asthma and COPD, by 2025. Subsequently, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted by the United Nations in 2015. Sustainable Development Goal 3 includes targets to reduce mortality due to NCDs by one third and achieve universal health coverage, including access to safe, effective, quality and affordable essential medicines for all. And so with this background in mind, we can move on to think about chronic respiratory diseases. Where should we be directing our activities so that we can improve the diagnosis, treatment and monitoring of asthma and COPD in the context of a people-centred primary healthcare based strategy that leaves no one behind? My role at headquarters focuses on the management of chronic respiratory diseases. Colleagues within the health promotion department cover disease prevention areas such as reducing air pollution and smoking cessation. I'm tasked with developing so-called normative work such as guidelines and standards relating to asthma and COPD care. The only guidance which currently exists is the WHO package of essential non-communicable disease interventions, more commonly known as the PEN package. PEN is targeted at the primary healthcare level in low resource settings and contains a module on chronic respiratory diseases with protocols for the assessment, diagnosis and management, both acute and long-term, of asthma and COPD. 
There are marked differences between the PEN protocols and the current GINA recommendations, and so there is a need to review the current evidence and make recommendations considering the resources available in different parts of the world. An area which is related and vitally important is that of access to inhalers. There are huge discrepancies in access to inhalers across the globe. The last WHO country capacity survey in 2019 reported that bronchodilators were only available in half of public primary healthcare facilities in low-income countries and steroid inhalers only in only one in five, despite both drugs being on the WHO essential medicines list since the late 1970s. Clearly, there is no point in spending time and money in developing guidelines if basic drugs such as salbutamol and beclomethasone are not available. Advocacy, education and awareness around the diagnosis and treatment of asthma and COPD are hugely important, and I know that many GAP members are involved in such activities. I wish you all the best for the Global Respiratory Summit today, and I hope we can find ways to work together and improve care for people living with chronic respiratory conditions across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and I certainly appreciate um, that overview of WHO and, again, the way in which they are advancing and moving forward um, in, in working on chronic respiratory disease. I think that um, the shocking notion that fewer than 50% of patients have access to the basic essential medications on the WHO list is something that, uh, again, we as a community just simply cannot accept. And certainly I, I believe is, is an effort of the policy changes and initiatives that we'll continue to address and work together. Um, I am going to be attending the WHO Guard meeting in October, and uh, we will be having some discussions about the, the role of GARD, the future of the way that GARD operates in relation to GAP. Uh, Sarah and I now are meeting on a monthly basis um, and, and discussing the role that GAP will play in advancing the patient voice in respiratory at the WHO. She has offered that in 2022, uh, there could be an opportunity at the General Assembly to present uh, and to, again, have GAP greater recognized in the, the General Assembly of the WHO. So I'm really excited about this relationship, about Sarah's leadership at uh, WHO and the way that uh, we now have such a, a, a strong connection to raise the patient voice in chronic respiratory disease. <clears throat> So as we begin now to look forward, um, I want to just emphasize that again, there are a number of ways that and projects that, that we wish for each of you to consider your level of engagement and support. Um, certainly in the area of research, um, we already conducted a, a global survey last year on oral steroid usage and had over 2,500 patients from 30 different countries participate in that work. We've got publications ongoing there, but we would like to continue those types of projects where we get a better understanding uh, on the, the research topics, the real world evidence that is most meaningful to our patient community. And so that can happen if you have ideas if, that you would like to move forward for research projects, please bring them forth and we are happy to support and work together to advance those. We already spoke about the registries. Again, we would encourage you to engage with uh, organizations like Secure Derm and COPD Foundation and Allergy and Asthma Network on those registry projects. The World Awareness Days in 2022 have already been set and we will certainly kick off with World Asthma Day in May. Uh, and then continue the work on uh, World Immunology Day, which actually is in April, and then the other days, as I mentioned before, in COPD, atopic dermatitis, urticaria, and other conditions. Um, on those awareness days, what you should see is a communications toolkit that is shared with you from Suzanne and Victor and, and sent out to the full membership to engage and leverage across your channels. 
So the point is that we have consistent messaging on those World Awareness Days, and that we also have the opportunity to highlight the great work you're doing in country. So please feel free to communicate back with us when you have uh, different initiatives or um, programs on the World Awareness Days and throughout the year, because that really is the best way for us to share the best practices and to learn from one another. We did conduct a uh, severe asthma audit uh, through the London School of Economics, and that publication will be forthcoming here at the end of the year, beginning of 2022. Not quite sure when it will be um, accepted. It's been submitted, but not accepted for publication. Um, but this severe asthma audit actually looked across 12 countries and recognized where the gaps are in severe asthma care. And so this will help us to continue to align our policy priorities in severe asthma specifically. Next is digital health and telehealth. And I know that that plays an important role for several of our member organizations um, like Love Air, uh, that is led by Shane Fitch. Uh, and so if you have an interest in implementing digital health or telehealth in your organization, please reach out to myself or to Shane have a conversation about the way that you could do so. At Allergy and Asthma Network, we actually have now an asthma coach program um, where we are delivering telehealth visits on an ongoing basis to underserved communities. And we've got remote monitoring of things like spirometry, pulse oximetry, um, and, and that in fractional exhaled nitric oxide that actually are helping us to better monitor and manage patients long term. The Disease State Resource Center, that's what I was speaking about before, of building this library and central repository of the resources across country and from our members. So this is an opportunity again in 2022 for us to build out that resource center on the different topics and disease states that you see here. And then finally, we have our key performance indicators to achieve the strategic objectives that uh, have been set by the GAP Board of Directors to maintain financial sustainability, which I'm very pleased to tell you that we have a uh, substantial reserve uh, in the GAP funding, and we have the resources to continue our work for years into the future. We also, as you know, are building our organizational capacity. That is, as our staff has grown now to three full-time positions, we are uh, hiring and, and searching now for our next executive director. And if you know of anyone after the Global Respiratory Summit, we will circulate the job description. Um, if you know of anyone, if you yourself are interested in that executive director role, I would love to speak with you um, as we plan to fill that role by the end of the year uh, at, for the next GAP executive director. And then to achieve our strategic object objectives of driving awareness, creating educational programming and resources, and advancing advocacy and health policy. And that really is the focus of all of the work that we do. Anytime a new project or opportunity comes across my desk as the GAP president, I ask myself the question, how does this fit into those strategic objectives? How does this help us raise that collective patient voice in chronic respiratory disease and, and should we be involved to achieve our mission. And so again, these are the, the areas that the GAP board has charged uh, the staff and, and I as the president with engaging in these kinds of opportunities and programs and, and we will continue to do so and represent the patient community to the best of our ability. So how can you get involved? Again, first and foremost, please uh, connect and send us your disease state resources that you would like listed in that library. Secondly, engage in our World Awareness Day activities. As you see our monthly newsletter, as you receive the communication plans and toolkits, incorporate them into your communication plans, into your activities in country. Thirdly, if you're interested in the Breakover Alliance and the Act on COPD campaign, please reach out, let us know. We've got a wealth of assets 
We can also connect you with in-country resources um, at the uh, organization that is sponsoring these campaigns to ensure that you have exactly what you need to address the issue of Saba over-reliance and of advancing patient rights in COPD. Next, we do have a process to fund programs. As you all know, as members of GAP, we have a request for funding application that you can complete on any project and that GAP will support, consider and support up to 25% of the overall budget. And so again, we can't solely fund projects. We want you to come to the table with projects that you've already secured some funding and are in need of additional funding to advance your work. We have those resources set aside and we absolutely want to support you in your work in country. Please do amplify things across the social media channels. Make sure that you're following GAP on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Um, Suzanne does such a wonderful job across all the channels of getting our messages out. And we really appreciate your efforts in amplifying across those social media channels. And then consistent engagement with the GAP team and staff. Uh, Victor and Suzanne work very hard uh, every day to you know, make sure that we are doing the right activities to support and bring that collective patient advocacy voice forward. And so please don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, now that we do have greater resources at GAP and we've got a, a wonderful um, staff, I, I hope that you find opportunities to get to know them, to work alongside them, and, and certainly um, we're here to serve and support you. I just wanna say as the president of GAP, how much I appreciate your continued support. Um, the last two years have been challenging. Uh, I, you know, I never dreamed that we would be sitting here having a virtual global respiratory summit in September of 2021. Um, it seems like a very long time ago that we were together in Milan, and, and I certainly look forward to the time that we can gather again, but your continued support has encouraged me and has certainly helped me to um, stay devoted to advancing the mission of GAP and serving as your president. And I know that the remainder of the board feels the same. And then finally, a way for you to be engaged is in the idea of board nominations and participating in the board. Um, each year we do have board nominations and, and move the uh, executive committee slate forward. And so if you want to get more involved in GAP and its leadership, please again, connect with us and, and we will be happy to talk with you about the way to do that. So now is the time actually that we are going to close out this general session and move into our breakout sessions. And again, we are gonna entrust Victor to magically teleport us to our various rooms. But as we do that, uh, Nicole, if you will once again wave and say hello to everyone, Nicole is going to be facilitating um, our COPD breakout session. So if you signed up for that session, you should be in the room with Nicole in about two or three moments. Um, if you signed up for the asthma session, uh, Vanessa, if you'll wave quickly here, wave and tell everyone you'll be in the room with Vanessa Foran from Asthma Canada. And then if you um, are in the rare disease session, you'll be with Migdalia. So Migdalia, will you please also wave and say hello to everyone? <laughs> 